Ahora sí, vamos a empezar y, y vamos a, a continuar con el programa de hoy. Ahora sí, voy a dar la bienvenida. Me llamo Janvier Williams Comri. Um, soy la directora ejecutiva de Afroresistencia. Este evento se llama Entre Fronteras, más allá de la narrativa convencional, Haití, género y migración. Eh, los objetivos de, de estas llamadas son siempre de traerle a la comunidad, no solamente de Afroresistencia, pero sino de la región y también de las diferentes organizaciones que nos acompañan información sobre lo que está pasando en el tema de migración afrodescendiente. De antemano quiero darle las gracias a Delcy, que es nuestra coordinadora de raza, migración y género, que ha estado coordinando estas llamadas y que de verdad ha tomado el liderazgo de no solamente coordinar las llamadas, pero también de organizar este, este, un grupo regional de migración negra y sus travesías. Entonces le, me gustaría resaltar el trabajo que ha hecho Delcy a través de los meses para de verdad traer este trabajo a, a la luz. El tema de hoy, como les mencioné, que es a más allá de la narrativa IT, género y migración, sale de lo que hemos estado viendo en las noticias y no viendo. Porque el tema de IT, aunque... Estado, ha estado visible marginalmente, debo, debo decir, en el tema a través de los años, en el tema de migración, no ha estado tan visible como se merece. Y no ha estado tan visible como se merece porque sabemos que es un tema de justicia racial. Y los temas de justicia racial son muy pocas veces resaltados porque si se resaltan, se sabe que tenemos que hablar de otros temas como de reparaciones, como de acceso a salud, como de acceso a, a derechos laborales como, y como de derechos a la migración. Entonces, muy pocas veces resaltan el tema de, de, de Haití como un tema de justicia racial y lo separan como un tema de economía o un tema de justicia climática pero no un tema transversal um, que impacta a tantos, um, no solamente a tantos, tantos temas, pero también a tantas comunidades. Pero para Afroresistencia no, no dividimos estos temas. Es más, resaltamos impactos y comunidades que son muy, um, muy a menudo invisibilizados especialmente en relación a género, como es el tema de la mujer afrodescendiente. Tenemos un panel espectacular, tenemos, una, tenemos invitadas espectaculares, tenemos a Gerlin Joseph de Haitian Bridge Alliance, que nos acompañan hoy, tenemos a Jemima Peer, que es activista con Black Alliance for Peace, tenemos a Emanuela Duyon, de Policité, y estoy segura que no estoy pronunciando eso bien. Y tenemos a Martín Jean-Baptiste, que es una partera um, que nos acompaña entre, entre fronteras, ¿no? Entonces, vamos a... Voy a cederle la palabra a nuestra primera invitada de hoy, que es Gerlene Joseph, que es la presidenta de Haitian Bridge Alliance, que tiene una misión de guiar, elevar y empoderar a les inmigrantes haitianes, haitianas y haitianos a través de la defensa de la organización, la divulgación y los servicios directos, incluidos entre otros. Y también se desempeña como presidenta de Word and Action, que es una organización que tiene como objetivo el prevenir y disminuir la ocurrencia de abuso sexual infantil en nuestra comunidad. Um, ella también utiliza su plataforma de FYI Radio Ministry con corresponsales en África y Corea del Sur para dar la voz a los sin voz de costa a costa y en todo el mundo. 
Entonces lo vamos a dar espacio a Gerlene Joseph. Gerlene, bienvenida. Good morning, Good morning uh, 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 family. Thank you so much for having me, Sister Genevieve, and the entire team at Afro Resistance. Um, as we look into the realities of Black bodies in motion throughout the world, um, it's been extremely painful experiences. But today, as we speak about the lives of all of our brothers and sisters, we will also remember and honor and celebrate them. As my sister Genevieve mentioned, my name is Gerlin Joseph. I am the founder and executive director of the Haitian Wood Alliance. We are um, a Black-led, Haitian women-led organization that is providing critical services and support for Black migrants coming from the Caribbean, South and Central America, and the continent of Africa, making the journey to come and ask for asylum in the United States. As the only Black-led, the only Haitian woman-led organization on the border, we have been able to provide humanitarian assistance, legal support, and once people get into the country, those who find themselves in immigration prison, instead of being released to, be, to rejoin their family, we created the first Black Immigrants Bell Fund to be able to pay for their freedom. Um, to go back to everything in this amazing um, introduction, we, we all saw what happened under the bridge last month. We all saw the pictures, we all saw the videos. And we witnessed, the world witnessed what we as Black immigrants, Haitian immigrants, have been experiencing for a very long time. So it is again my honor to be with each and every one of you, to be with some amazing thumb jump, as we say in Haiti, like Emmanuel Douillon, Jemima Pierre, and Martin Jean Baptiste, because they are on the front line around the world paving the way, standing on the shoulders of giant to be the voice, to be the faces, to make sure that black immigrants are not forgotten. I also want to highlight the fact that the invisibility of, Afro, of people of African descent throughout South and Central America. And when we speak of immigration, when we acknowledge that the voices of Afro-Latinx people are unheard, erased from the, from, the, from the narrative and from the movement. So I want to acknowledge that as well. So Haitian in movement, why, how? We know the history of Haiti, 1804, one independence against the mightiest army at the time, created a pathway for true freedom and liberation. And the world, the rest of the world, the West found that unacceptable for people descended of enslaved people to actually say, we will no longer accept to be enslaved. We will lead the world in freedom we will lead the world in, 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 in liberation. And my brothers and sisters, Haiti is still paying for that leadership. And we stand against all internal violences in our home country of Haiti, in countries such as Cameroon and Mauritania. And we stand against all external violences from the international communities who continues to enslave our people at home and abroad. What happened in the Rio last month is an example of the continued legacy of anti-Black racism, continued legacy of dehumanizing Black bodies as we move and we understand there is no safe space for us. They have created incredibly impossible conditions 
at home that is forcing people to leave, yet they are making it impossible for us to find protection and safety no matter where we find ourselves. And as I stand before you again, as a Haitian woman, as an American woman, as a Haitian American woman descended of enslaved people, sitting and standing proud and tall in the continuing to leading the fight for all of our people, no matter where we find ourselves. It is a blessed opportunity for me to share with you stories of maybe two people, one woman who traveled from Haiti who was the victim of survivors of the earthquake that happened in 2010. And she made her way from Haiti to Brazil and walked from Brazil to the US-Mexico border. She was put in prison. She developed breast cancer and was deported after that because she could not pay the $30,000 that was required for us to pay her ransom. I will also share story of Zaza, a, a, a black LGBTQ transgender woman from Jamaica that our colleagues at BLMP have fought so really hard to get released after being imprisoned in these United States. So we will continue to share the stories and highlight stories of all black people no matter where we are from. We will continue to push until we are all free, because we understand that our collective liberation and freedom are connected. They cannot be me without you. They cannot be you without me. So as we say in Haiti, I will stop here and we will continue later. Thank you so much, Jovief, back to you. Thank you very much, Gerlin for that. Thank you very much. We will be taking, um, pardon, regreso al, al español. Vamos a seguir, um, vamos a tomar preguntas uh, después que todas nuestras panelistas um, puedan comentar. Entonces, vamos a seguir con nuestra segunda invitada, que es Yamima Pierre, que nació en Haití y emigró a los Estados Unidos um, años más tarde. Ella es coordinadora con Black Alliance for Peace y profesora de estudios y antropología negros en la Universidad de California en Los Ángeles. Entonces, le cedo el espacio a Jemima Pierre. Um, Jemima, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, it's morning for me here in California. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, I, it's my pleasure to join you in this conversation along with these wonderful Haitian women. Um, and thank you to Afro Resistance and um, for inviting me. I'm, I'm going to try to speak slowly because I know I speak fast um, for the language interpretation. I wanted to, um, you know, I, I migrated to the US um, in the early 90s as a child. Um, following um, my dad who had left in, uh, not early 90s, sorry, early 80s, 1980s as a child, following my dad who had left um, uh, Haiti in, in the mid 1970s, um, soon after we were born. Um, and partly because of political per persecution under the US backed uh, brutal Duvalier dictatorship. Um, early 1980s, Miami, was known, uh, was very bad for Haitian uh, migrants at the time. There were these people, a lot of people coming through by boat and they were called um, boat people. Um, and, and also this is the beginning of the AIDS crisis. And so there's a lot of racism, anti-Black racism in particular against Haitian migrants in, in, um, in the 80s. So you have the, one of the first large waves of migrations to South Florida, um, or, or around that, and also with that, you have the extreme racism of the U.S. government, which 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 established a Chrome Detention Center for so those people who don't know, which is a permanent detention. Det um, detention camp for migrants, including children um, as young as six years old um, in its capacities, people who were accused of having AIDS, um, accusations that Haitians were only um, poverty uh, migrants, and so on. Later, um, 
10, uh, 10 years later, you have then Guantanamo Bay before it became a prison for people from the Middle East who were denied due process after the US invaded the uh, Iraq. You have the holding of Haitian, um, you have a, a prison camp for Haitian asylum seekers between 1991 and 1993 um, uh, until it was ordered closed by a judge in 1993 because the situation there was really terrible. Uh, and then again, you have around 2004, 2005, the large detention of families um, 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 in Texas, in, in prisons of, of Haitian migrants and other black migrants in particular. Um, and and one, part, one, air, one detention center I know of, because I worked there as a translator, um, that was the Huddle Detention Center in, in right outside of Austin, Texas, that had at any given time more than 200 children um, from ages of two to 16. And here, you know, I was talking to a lot of Haitian women and children. So 1994, I'm um, sorry, 2004, 2005, and 2006. So racism has always played a key role in US re reaction to Haitian uh, and migrants in particular and other black migrants and non-white migrants. And so this is clear we see in US immigration laws. And, but uh, we do ourselves, I think, a disservice if we do not acknowledge it acknowledge, I think, two key facts about Haitian migration, um, not only into the US, but throughout the Americas. And those two key facts are very much related. So first, as you can see from what I've relayed so far, Haitian migration to the US and throughout the Americas is actually not a recent phenomenon. Um, and it certainly did not begin um, after 2004 or 2010. And I'm sure people know this, but I do think it's important to link, to talk about that, but it's also linked to the second key point I want to make, which is that waves of Haitian migration and asylum seeking are very much directly connected to US imperialism and domination of the Caribbean and Latin America. And if we don't take this reality into account, the reality of, of brutal US imperialism as the root of the problem, we would not be able to stop the ongoing crisis of brutality against migrants marked by a gendered anti-Blackness, right? So, and this is the work we've been doing um, at the Black Alliance for Peace, our Haiti Americas Committee has worked to point to the key machinations of US and other Western nations in destabilizing Haiti. Now, all the waves of migration that I mentioned above are directly um, linked to US imperialism. So the migration wave in 1980s was because of the political brutalities of the US backed dictator, uh, divided dictatorship and you also US economic policies um, in Haiti that destroyed the economies and enhanced poverty. The wave of migration in the 1990s was after the US backed coup d'etat against Haiti's first democratically elected president, Jean Bertrand Aristide, and the repression by US trained paramilitaries of uh, uh, troops on the population. The wave of migrants after 2004 is the result of yet another US backed coup d'etat against Haiti's elected government. This coup d'etat really set up the stage for the complete dismantling of the Haitian state by foreign powers as the UN Security Council gave cover for this coup d'etat, dispatching a full-blown military occupation under the guise of peacekeeping. So from this moment, Haiti has been run by the core group, uh, a core group of four foreign predominantly white diplomats, and which make all decisions in concert with the US State Department and the Organization of American States. So it is the same occupation that led Haitians to Brazil after the, the earthquake, because Brazil also led the military wing of the peacekeeping occupation. And we have to know this, right? It's because, because Brazil was in Haiti that Haitians then come to Brazil. And, and I think it's important now to think about this latest wave of migration, which comes after the US installed PT, PHTK uh, government, corrupt government the last um, uh, 10 years, Michel Martelly and jo Jovenel Moïse, that, that, that also, you know, uh, backed by corruption and violence against the Haitian people. And so all of these are important, but even before the 1980s, and I know I'm running quickly out of time, but before the 1980s, you have waves of migration going back to the 1915 US occupation of Haiti, which took a, which rewrote the Haitian constitution, took away lands from people, um, people who were working on their lands, and then sending, you know, and forcing the people who no longer had land to go work on US corporation plantations in Cuba, Right. And so this is the early 1900s where you had where the Marines were all over. They're deployed in Panama, Nicaragua, Cuba, Haiti and the Dominican Republic and the banking and capital interests of the U.S. government were there. They needed 
cheap and free labor. And so you have the pushing of Haitians out to Cuba, to Panama, and then later on, as the US occupied the Dominican Republic, send the, uh, the Haitians to work in US owned sugar plantations in the Dominican Republic. So the point here is to show the relationship of Haitian migration throughout the Americas as something that is not new, but it's something that is directly the result of US interventions in the politics, economics, culture of the peoples of the region. And now we see the pressures on other governments, which have their own anti-Black histories, right, in Latin America, and the treatment of their own Black populations. So these governments are then further given reason to further mistreat Haitians and other Black immigrants in their, in their midst. So, so I wanted to, so the, the point here is to really talk about all of this and to talk about what it means then for women and what in particular, because we are connected to the land. We need, you know, women are, are just as important to, or more important, I think, to, to the nation. And so I wanted to really end by making two key points. So the one is that there's, there's a proliferation of gang violence in Haiti now, um, and gang violence has long been an issue. And it has gotten worse as the oligarchy and their international partners have flooded the poor areas with hundreds and thousands of guns. And you have lots of young men who are pulled into violence because of poverty and instability created by constant meddling of, 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 the, of the country. And it's important here to think about the causes of violence as not something that's genetically wrong with these young men and sometimes some women that are drawn to, 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 to this. But I also always think about these young people's mothers who have to bear you know, the, the, the fact of their children causing all these violence, um, but also these children who are being armed by a, a, a ruthless oligarchy in an international community. And then I wanted to say this, you know, the Ghanaian writer um, Ama Ata Aido, talking about the African woman today said, and this is a quote, Africans should take charge of our land, its wealth, our lives, and the burden of our own development because it is not possible to advocate independence for our continent without also believing that African women must have the best that that environment have, can offer. Now, I want to apply this to the position of Haitian women and girls, because if we don't advocate for the creation of the best environment in Haiti for Haitian um, women and girls, the crisis of migration and all that comes with it, the violence and exploitation will not only be cyclical, but will be worse with each cycle. And so at the Black Alliance for Peace, what we demand is the end of the continuous 217 years of racist meddling um, in Haiti. We demand the US boot off of Haiti, Haitian women's necks in particular. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jamima. So we can hear now how we have been building, right? So Gerlin spoke about the, the plight of what has been happening um, currently, not only at the border, but how this has been building as well, and and, and the, the impacts that that the U.S. has been having on people domestically um, in the people domestically in the United States, right? Especially um, from Haiti. And then Jamima laid it out, right? What does intervention? So what does inter the history of interventions um, on Haiti mean for? for the lives, the actual human lives in Haiti. What does Minista mean? So when we talk about the United, the United Nations and their quote unquote plight to protect, right? And how does that then drive a migration to Brazil? What does that then mean for gang violence, for example? And how does that a driving force also to push migration? And then what does that mean for international relations in the region? And what does that mean for a gender perspective, right? So we're gonna keep on developing and we're gonna keep on building as we then hand it over to Emanuela Duyon. And I'm again, flipping into English and Spanish. And I'm gonna now flip again, sorry to the Language Justice League, pero voy a cambiar a español. Um, me, me perdonan, por favor. Nuestra tercera invitada, que es Emanuela Duyon, es una economista, es una activista, bloguera y oradora haitiana. Es la directora ejecutiva de Policité, que es una firma consultora y grupo de expertas en, que se enfoca en desarrollo económico. Es miembro de No Dormiremos, que es un colectivo de jóvenes haitianas y haitianos comprometidos de incidir en, forma, en la forma en que el Estado haitiano sirve a la población y en la lucha de su corrupción, 
la impunidad y la injusticia social. Ella tiene un conocimiento sólido de la política global um, y de las costumbres haitianas en particular, y es feminista económica. Entonces, bienvenida, Emanuela Duyón, a nuestro espacio de afroresistencia. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for organizing this event on this topic. It is really my pleasure to join this conversation today. And as a Black woman, a Haitian woman, it was quite hard for me to witness the refugee crisis at the US border and the treatment received by those refugees from my own country. And we definitely must create spaces to question our realities and share perspectives to advance social justice for all Black people worldwide. And I was not born when Haitians started fleeing the country under the Duvalier dictatorship. I was probably less than a year old when they fled after the coup against Gilberto Aristide in the early 90s. This time around, I'm 31, I'm a social justice activist and I'm witnessing this happening to my people. The experience is even more like, it's even harder because I'm a black woman, I'm a black Haitian woman, and I saw mothers and children under this bridge. I heard the stories. I'm privileged not to be one of them, but I can understand and I'm grateful for people like Gerlin who are working directly with them. More than before, the current reality of migration from Haiti and this refugee crisis forced us to look at it from a gender perspective. The fact that refugees are mostly coming from Central America, they cross the Dalian jungle, this cast the light on the peril and risk of this journey. Those risks are higher for women. We can imagine it now. We can see them, we can imagine them walking. And we now hear the stories of women being raped along the road. And it's, it's not that hard as to imagine what they went through on this long road. Imagine them sleeping at night in places they've never been before, surrounded by complete strangers, where in places where they do not even speak the language. Many of them carried their first child during this journey and have to take care of newborns alone in many cases. Some had a partner or husband, others did not. The challenges that they faced, um, I, I recently watched a short video of a Black Haitian woman on the road. She will not utter a word. She was completely silenced. And the people who showed the video were sharing it on social media along with her passport picture because they were trying to find her family in Haiti. I was like, was she always like this? What happened to her? Why wouldn't she speak? And it made me realize that so many things probably happened on this journey. And many Haitian women who had the dream to find safety and peace, witnessed, witnessed this dream turn quickly into a nightmare. Some contracted disease and some are forever traumatized. And it's not only because they had to cross a jungle, but we, it's also because they are women and they are black women. We know of racism toward black people in America. We know about the sexism as well. We've heard horror stories and racist acts targeting Haitian and Haitian communities in the Dominican Republic, for example. And those places, those countries in Central America, were like transit country for them on this journey to America. And they were exposed and in, probably they were victims too of some racism. And we can ask like several questions. Why do they flee? Is it for economic reason? Are they fleeing persecution? Is it both what's their status? Are they really refugees? So I, I've, like I've seen people asking those questions. Why do they choose the US? There is a tendency to link waves of migration from Haiti to the US 
to the direct deterioration of the economic situation. However, it is usually not the only cause. And in Haiti, you can hardly isolate the financial crisis from the political crisis, from the social turmoil. And it's hard to say that people who are like at the borders, they are not asylum seekers because they are here for better economic situation. It's hard to say it when there is always some kind of political crisis in Haiti and there, there is always some kind of some reason why people might need safety, why they may be persecuted. And Haitian book people, I, I want to repeat what Jamie Marpierre said in her presentation, but Haitian both people started fleeing the US years ago. Some people dated back to the 60s, some to the 90s, 70s. For sure, we know that they were fleeing a country under a ferocious dictatorship. And the policy back then was to return them back as quickly as possible and to return as many people as possible. And a few decades later, both loads of refugees began fleeing Haiti after jean Bertrand Aristide was ousted by a military coup. And then, there were a campaign killing people and torturing people in Haiti. So many people were fleeing the country. And the policy at that time was also to force people to stay home, to stay in Haiti, and to force them to go to some screening to make sure that they were really facing, like they, their life was really in danger in Haiti. And it was unfair to some people. And today, we are after like what happened on the, that bridge in Texas. We are back to the same situation. We have people fleeing a country devastated, like Jimmy Ma described it, gang activity, etc. And the policy is the same: send them home, send them back home, send as many as possible. And we need to move. This is not how it should be handled. Those people, they have a right for, they, they have a right and they, are, they have a legitimate reason to flee this country and they deserve due process. And from a social justice perspective, we need to move toward an egalitarian society that guarantees respect for refugees' rights. And we need to insist on it because for some reason, whenever it comes to Haiti, people have all kinds of excuses as to why those people should stay home, why fleeing the country is not a solution. But when we comes to history, like people from like different countries at some point had to flee their own country. Some even were refugees in Haiti. It's not new, it happens everywhere and refugees from everywhere deserve due process. And moreover, like countries like the United States have a moral responsibility toward Haiti because of past policies or intervention that harm Haiti's economy. And I know that there are like efforts to assist women and children, but we need to keep paying attention and demand more because they are at high risk and women and children face, face more risk on this journey and the hardship or like they have like many hardship before they reach that border and they definitely deserve better treatment. And I know my time is up, um, thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Emanuela, um, por tu intervención. Emanuela, entonces, ha construido también su perspectiva desde una perspectiva económica. Y entonces, y siguen las preguntas en el chat. Las preguntas las vamos a abordar después de nuestra última panelista. Entonces, voy de nuevo, perdonen, voy de nuevo a nuestra cuarta invitada, que es Martín Jean-Baptiste, que es partera 
que ha estado involucrada en la salud de la mujer, ofreciendo servicios sí, bueno. integrales en la ciudad de Nueva York desde 1986, después de graduarse en su, con su licenciatura en ciencias en enfermería de Mount St. Vincent. Um, es directora ejecutiva de la Fundación Advancement of Haitian Midwives, y ella cree firmemente en la capacidad innata de las mujeres para cuidar de sí mismas y de sus familias. Ella cree en apoyar el derecho de las mujeres a una atención médica segura de apoyo informada durante todo su ciclo de vida. Su sueño es ayudar a promover el modelo de atención de partería y aumentar el acceso de atención de partería en Haití. Entonces, bien, bienvenida a Martín um, Jean Baptiste. Martín. Hello, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for hosting this and for including me in the conversation. Um, I know a lot was said ahead of time, and I was the, uh, I was glad to be brought onto the conversation, but um. I didn't have that much time to really prepare. So I'm just gonna um, wing it a little bit and um, kind of tag on from where uh, the other speakers um, left off and talk about how midwifery really plays a role in um, women's health care and how we can really be a change maker in that, um, that, in that way. So, um, so I'm going to try to more to discuss the realities facing migrant and uh, uh, immigrant women and their role of the midwife. So health needs and outcomes in relation to migration is a very complex topic, to say the least. And it's very interconnect. It has many interconnected and intersecting factors that we have to really look at. There's a really dynamic. That means it's always changing interplay between a lot of multiple factors from starting from the um, healthcare received in the country of origin, to the migration process itself, to the issues faced once settling into the new country. And now we're going to add another layer to that with the recent events of now um, being sent back to Haiti and what that means and re-entering into the healthcare system um, with um, many of the women um, having no concept of being Haitian or having lived in Haiti and knowing how to access any kind of services. As, um, they were coming from other countries and being sent back because they were Haitian and being sent to Haiti and they have no connection in Haiti and haven't been to Haiti for um, years. So we've, we put all that into context. We have to look at the, how these factors interplay um, and their origin of how to access care, both in Haiti and when they uh, reach their new country uh, that they're trying to immigrate to. So I wanted to start with what, because I didn't know the general audience also, was what is a midwife and um, how, why uh, they should play a major role. So even though midwifery is one of the oldest profession in history, going back to the Bible, lots of people still don't know what a midwife is. I always say, you know, being a black Haitian woman and a midwife, people really don't know where I'm coming from or who I am or what it means. So just a little um, background about midwifery. So midwifery now is, um, midwives provide sexual and reproductive health care throughout the life cycle through women. So that's preconception, care, contraception, family planning, cervical cancer screening, treatment, healthcare education, comprehensive maternity care services. So that's um, when you're pregnant, in labor and birth, those postpartum period, and also newborn care, and offer trauma-informed, gender-based violence uh, education and awareness and survivor care also. So it's pretty comprehensive. If you wanted to so-called compare the profession to something, it's you can kind of compare it to obstetricians, except we don't do surgery, and except our philosophy of care is way different. And we start from a, a place of building on someone's strengths and where they are and taking it from there and with a lot of education and shared decision making, which is not really in the other um, medical model. Um, just uh, shared decision making is so much different than um, informed consent because anyone can convince anyone to do what they think is best. 
But if you're really in partnership with somebody that shared decision making and helping them develop what's best for them and their family. If you take care of a woman, you're taking care of her family and the community she belongs to. So safe, respectful, accessible care is of optimal um, concern when you're um, uh, dealing with uh, women and especially migrant women. Um, so women have, uh, midwives have been proven to be the most cost effective reproductive health care providers. According to the WHO and International Confederation of Midwives and the State of the World's Midwif Report, two thirds of all maternal and newborn deaths could be averted with skilled midwifery care. Yeah, you heard that correctly. Two thirds can be averted. Almost all global maternal deaths could be prevented by ensuring that all women have access to quality, respectful, and equitable maternity care. Midwives could deliver over 87% of all essential sexual, reproductive, and maternal and newborn health services. So that's why I don't like to look at midwifery just in the vacuum of pregnancy. We really take care of women throughout the life cycle. We're often the only provider that they'll ever see in their lifetime. So if they weren't getting pregnant or concerned about any sexual reproductive um, means, they may never ever see a healthcare provider in their life. So that's the optimal time to kind of catch them and get them in the system and um, help empower them to of how to make um, life choices. So if we were looking at this whole migration issue, I, I broke it down to three parts, life in Haiti, the immigration, uh, the migration journey, I should say, and then life at, in America. So being black, a black woman giving birth in the USA, and then on top of that being a Haitian black woman, our stats are really dramatically worse. Um, so life in Haiti. So uh, the Haiti has one of the highest maternal and infant mortality rates in the Western hemisphere. Um, like I said, midwives are in a prime position to help decrease that toll. But in Haiti, unfortunately, there are not enough midwives. There are under 400 midwives in the country. It's been estimated that we would need at least 2,200 midwives to totally serve the population in Haiti. Right now, another thing that is happening in Haiti is accessibility to midwifery care. Um, like I said, there's not enough midwives. They are dispersed in all 10 departments of Haiti, which is good, but there's still not enough to care for them. So reinforcing midwifery, that's why I started a foundation for advancement of Haitian midwives to help empower and reinforce the care that they do to help um, them be able to do the work that they already are doing. So it's not reinventing the wheel, it's um, uh, enforcing them to carry on to provide sexual reproductive health care to start and lots of teaching and education starting from um, young age um, in the schools of um, teaching about body autonomy, teaching about gender based violence and um, things like that because um, right now there's uh, the midwives have organized and do have a hotline. So anyone can act in Haiti right now can access midwifery care with questions about anything sexual and reproductive, any general health care questions, anything about pregnancy or anything else. So there's a midwife hotline. It's called Adosage Femme, and it's free. So women can access it if they have a digital cell phone. They will dial 8227. If they have a NotCom phone, they would dial 2814-0171. And then, so now let's go about the migration journey. So migrant women are at increased risk for poor pregnancy outcomes. Sometimes it's due because nutrition, they could have blood pressure issues, diabetes. Um, they're more prone to have low birth weight babies, preterm babies, and postpartum mood disorders. Um, we need more maternity care models which incorporate the midwifery model of care to meet the needs of all women in society to ensure accessible, equitable, care and um, help decrease some of the health inequalities that exist. So if every country, no matter where anyone migrated to, had midwifery more incorporated in their systems and has that as part of how they deal with migrants uh, um, at the borders or wherever, once they're in, integrated into any communities, it would greatly decrease um, some of these Ill, Ill effects that we are seeing. 
um, uh, okay, so the effects of uh, migration have physical effects, mental health effects, and also the socioeconomic status or effects that are involved. And I won't go deeply in, into it, but increased risk of sexually transmitted infections, gender-based violence, uh, anxiety, depression, um, post-traumatic stress um, disorder, lack of support systems when they're here in isolation, lack of ability to earn a living and have basic human needs met such as shelter and feeling safe and safety. Um, life in the Americas, uh, so being black and um, being Haitian, like I said, um, really has um, effects on maternal um, morbidity and mortality. So that's, um, there's a term that was coined weathering. I, um, I'm sure people have heard of it that are on this call. And that's kind of like all the stuff that builds up on you being constantly exposed to trauma. People often tell me like, well, sometimes I don't even know how to answer it. Like, how is it now? So you're getting pictures from your family and friends in Haiti at the, you know, at the pool in Petroville, having a good time, then you're getting pictures of gangs and everything. So it's like life goes on. So is that is that a good thing or a bad thing that we're so resilient? Is that a compliment or not? But you do have to be able to keep going. But what's, what that does to your body, they're really studying this and what does it do to your DNA, to your genes? It affects every part of your, um, your being that you're not even at that moment feeling the trauma that you're weathering, you're, that you're carrying on yourself, but it, it it causes poor maternal health um, outcomes, chronic inflammation, obesity, depression, um, uh, a lot of hypertension, diabetes, and all of these are um, just carried within us. So it's when we're we looked at, we have higher risk of such and such and such and such. It's not so much your DNA that carries this, it's what's carried from before. So imagine someone migrating from Haiti to another country. So whatever happened to you in Haiti, you're carrying that of mm -hmm. living with, there's no gas today, no lock, this and that. And then you're you're going to another country, you're, you travel to that other country and everything that you um, uh, had to deal with just in your migration journey. And then once you are received in this new country, the treatment that you get and um, uh, the, trying to figure out to navigate the new system, especially being black, often not speaking English, and the racism and the implicit biases that you face every day, that's kind of even more weathering and more you're, that you're putting on your shoulders. I'm just watching my time. <laughs> uh, so we really need to recognize the need to go beyond just looking at people being pregnant or just women's issues or, or that's there. We're more than just a pregnant being. We need to look at more of a holistic framework which addresses physical, mental, and socioeconomic health. Um, we need to be able to um, provide uh, culturally competent health care to everybody, and especially when uh, they're in their uh, new country. And also, there's a, a, a shift of um, some of the care that's provided in Haiti because we're a, a, a whirlpool of NGOs and foreigners providing a lot of the healthcare. And that's something else that we should look at. That's why we start, I started FAM because I believe in empowering Haitian women that are already doing this work that to do the work that they do and, and um, not interfering. And they are a constant in their communities. These other people, they come and go. They are not part of the community. So they know what they need. They know what their community needs. And that's how um, things will get moved or things will be uh, done in a more positive way. And I'm going to end it at that. So just basically, I think just incorporating midwives when we're doing work on the borders, when we're doing any kind of um, policy, um, change for healthcare or sexual and reproductive health needs, I think midwives really need to be part of that conversation. Because like I said, they're usually that person that actually listens, that works collaboratively with other um, interdisciplinary teams to really um, not just take care of a pregnancy, not just take care of a sexually transmitted infection, not just take care. It's working in that combination. And that's the framework that we um, 
rely on. And I think having them a part of the conversation and the decision making is um, of utmost importance. And I could talk about midwifery all day, so I'll just stop right there. <laughs> Muchísimas gracias, Martín. Entonces hemos, hemos, déjame mirar mi documento, hemos hablado con, con todas las panelistas del día de hoy, ¿no? Entonces ahora sí vamos a abrir a un espacio de, de preguntas. Antes vamos a, ya vamos a quitar el pen, um, Elida, por favor, gracias. Um, ahora vamos a empezar con algunas de las preguntas que tenemos en, en el chat. Una de ellas, uh, lo estoy eh, buscando, perdón. Una de ellas es de Yania. Ajá. Eh, y creo que esto era dirigido a Gerlín, pero creo que cualquiera lo puede, lo puede preguntar. Y es um, si conocen de las estrategias de cuidado Désolé, au cas oh. répété, question pour moi, s'il uh -huh. vous plaît. Si. Um, Gerline, um, Yania, quería preguntar, ¿no puedes oír? Ahora sí. Si conoces de estrategias de cuidado y de resistencia, porque sin duda hay agencias con las que enfrentan a los riesgos durante la migración las mujeres. Qui langue nous voulez pour moi pour moi répondre? Est-ce que nous parlons créole, français ou bien anglais? Ou bien anglais? Inglés? Inglés está bien? Puede ser inglés o creo que puede ser. Joviev, can you repeat the question for me in yes. English, please? Yes. Yes, I can repeat in English. Yanya would like to know if you know of self-care strategies that women are using because um, to resist, because there must be, um, they are taking a lot of risk during, um, during migration. So is there any, anything that you know of that they are, that they're using to self-care during their trajectory? Uh, thank you so much for, for that question. Uh, Genevieve, I, I think you and I spoke about this last week. And when you are um, on the forefront caring for others, we tend to not care for ourselves, um, especially when it comes to the issues of black migrants at the US-Mexico border or black body uh, um, mobility as we cross 10, 15 countries in search of freedom, in search of a new home. So um, I will not lie to you all. It has been close to impossible. Um, it's been six years since I have taken a vacation and every time I try to take a day off, there is a catastrophe, there is a crisis that needs to be dealt with. But I can tell you at the same time that at the same time that for me, it has been a spiritual journey. And what I tell people that I do not carry um, the load um, of, of, of the trauma. Um, I'm able to process what I witnessed. I'm able to use that as a way to advocate. I'm able to use that as a way to highlight and uplift the narratives of the most impacted community members. And then when it is too heavy for me, I bring it back to God. I am, a, I am a missionary by heart and this is a mission field for me. And so therefore gospel music is my go-to um, remedy. Uh, when I get up in the morning and I cannot breathe, I put on some gospel music and I keep it moving through the day. And I also um, tend to go and, and think about our ancestors. I think about 
uh, Kathleen Flo, I think about Harriet Tubman, I think about all those amazing women who came before us and see how I can pull from the strength in their belief and their bravery to be able to make it to the next step. So I think for me, I am in this journey to be able to find a place to do that. And I think as well that I need to promise myself to be able to do that, but it is a journey and it's a very difficult one. But for me really is gospel music right now and being able to share that with my family. I have an extremely supportive family to be able to have a home that is loving, to have communities that are really coming around us really make things a little bit easier for me. Thank you, thank you so very much. Martine also wanted to add. I wanted to just tag along that point and um, the Foundation for Advancement of Haitian Midwives, this is another thing that I have found. Um, I think people, like I said, we Haiti is so filled with um, NGOs and people doing work in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And it's always about producing, producing. These same midwives are the same ones living that same life and are being traumatized and re-traumatized. So I feel like it's there's always this um, in the nonprofit world of looking for how many did you, how many births did you do? How many just like who's taking care of the midwives? And I have to say I pride, we pride ourselves in that we actually take care of the care provider and we do hold um, different mental health strategies and mental health workshops so that we can support them to do the work that they do. Because I think it is very difficult when you're living the same life as the ones that you're supposed to help and you're not getting any kind of extra service for yourself. Um, and I, I think a lot of people overlook that. So yeah, just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, something, something, something to also add as we are getting more questions if you have a question please go ahead and and raise your hand you can raise your hand by clicking on reactions um and and go ahead and raise your hand or you can also put it on on the chat um i see that there are questions that are written out in in creole on on the chat um I cannot read Creole if one of our interpreters can, can help us out and translate them. I see one is written out for Jamima. Jamima, if you can go ahead and, and read that and answer it, you can read it out loud and answer it. That would be great. In the meantime, um, I could also, it's not a question, it's more of a comment. There are, there are policies that are being put in place actively to scare people along the way, um, both, both residents and citizens in, in countries where people are migrating. And these are not new, they're just tactics to scare. Um, but for example, in the DR right now, um, Haitian women are being, um, being told that they can't go to to hospitals to give birth, for example, um, which is which is a violation of international norms and standards. But they're actually being told that they can't go to a hospital to give birth, right? So when we talk about the 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 gender component of migration, right? This is what we're speaking about, right? So this is an actual piece that impacts birthing people. Right, so, and, and it only impacts people that are, are given birth, right? Um, and the same thing when we talk about, we've been hearing accounts of um, uh, Nekokli, which is the, which is the border, border town, um, right before they have to, people are migrating to cross into the Tapon de Darien, which is into Panama, so from Colombia to Panama, both don't want to take women that are visibly pregnant. And that is because um, Panama is fearful that women will give birth while they are transiting on Panama land. So this again is, 
is impacting, it, there's a gender component to it. So when we speak about the gender component to migration, in this case, Haitian women that are migrating, this is things that are not being spoken and being articulated publicly because we're not speaking, uh, we're speaking about migration without gender. So this is why this call is so essential and important because it's bringing up um, specific issues that are impacting black women. And it's not only about birth, right? We also have um, girls, we have also have LGBTQ communities with all within um, gender and sexual and reproductive justice. And I, and I was reading it in the chats as well. So we have Michelle, who is part of our Language Justice League. Um, go ahead, Michelle. Oh, we can't hear you because you are in the language channel. And I don't know how to resolve that. So we will give, we'll, we'll hand it over. You can, you can type it up. We're gonna hand it over to Thais. Uh, hi, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure. I'm talking from Brazil and I'm, I didn't know about all this uh, story. And actually today I was written one article talking about uh, women's rights violation in women in prison in Brazil. And most of them, they, they are tortured and they cannot uh, go to the hospital to give birth. Uh, so my question is how we can bring uh, awareness about all these uh, races and gender human rights violations. If there is any kind of strategies or how we can yeah, make these, these stories uh, alive and globally. Thank you, Thais. Um, I think maybe Emma, Emanuela yeah, or- Yes, thank I, you. I, I would like to answer. Um, it's getting easier to raise awareness on issues and to let people know what's happening with social media. And I'll say if it is something related to a country like Haiti, one should try to create content that can be easily shared on WhatsApp, for example, because this is like the most used platform, I would say, and it, it can be shared so easily and so quickly. And another way to do it is like we did in Haiti recently with Free Haiti. Actually, we, we use what the people from Senegal use when they use Free Senegal. We had a hashtag and we explained why we used it, the issue we wanted to, to raise awareness on. And we explained what it was. We tagged people, influencers on social media. And for like the first few weeks, it was a success, I would say, because Haiti was a topic, people started talking about it. And I think it is something that can be, be replicate. And having having a hashtag, for example, Haitian refugee something, and then explain why you use it, why it's important, and then have other people commenting on the topic. I, I I also wanted to say um are you done Emanuela? I'm sorry. I think I think she froze. Okay. Oh, I think Emanuela froze. I insisted on social media because because I, I of course I, I use social media a lot. But there are like, of course, other other ways to do it. Like have like maybe event. I, I know that there is a group of students in Texas who organized a sit-in. Um, this was like an interesting way, a simple way to contribute and to raise awareness. Yeah, I, I would suggest those, but I'm sure that there are many other options. 
Thank you, Emanuela. I think Jamima wanted to add as well. Yeah, I, I, I did want to say um, quickly that, you know, I think one of the questions um, was about uh, how do we get people to know? And I think this, this is Afro resistance is wonderful for this because the language barrier is always the issue. There's so many articles that are published um, in English in particular. You know, I know that we publish a lot. Um, all, this, all this that we talk about in terms of like, especially with Black Alliance for Peace is talking about US interventions, US meddling in Haiti, the core group, all of that is in English, right? Um, especially those of us sitting in the heart of empire. And I think one of the th key things we need to do is actually translate more of our things so that we can put out these articles in Spanish language newspapers and stations and do and, and that way that people know, especially in countries that have large black populations, Colombia, um, Brazil, you know, Nicaragua and, and, and those places. Because I do think we need to know what's going on in these other places. I, I think a lot of people don't realize the extent of intervention and meddling um, throughout the Caribbean in Latin America, which is why. Um, so I think so. One of the key things we need to do is take these articles, write about them, get them published um, in in local newspapers, whatever we can do. And I think you know all of us can can try to do you know, especially us who are writing some of them, make sure that they get translated. So I do think that's an important thing because the most important thing is political education. And I don't think people know like the long history of the US in their own countries, what the US did to Panama, what the US did to Grenada, <laughs> which is the, you know, the anniversary was just last week of the US invasion of Grenada and what the US is trying to do in, other, in these other places, trying to create a Haitian situation in places like Cuba and, and stuff like that. So we need to remember that. I wanted to quickly address a comment, um, a, a set of questions um, in, 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 the, in the chat that, that I'm not sure the intention was to blame Haiti for its situation where it's in the question is, you know, can the people of Haiti understand that their actions that they're, they're eroding the social needs of the country or is, you know, we as black people need to without the, we need to address our own issues and stop black and black crime without depending on outside foreign intervention. The whole point of my presentation was to show that there's 217 years of counter revolution against the Haitian revolution. So it is foreign intervention. It is direct constant meddling in Haiti that has caused the situation in, in Haiti. It is the occupation. It is the UN raping of women and children, the minister soldiers that is causing all kinds of trouble in Haiti. And so, I am enraged by that question, I have to say, because this is the equivalent of blaming the victim for a situation that they do not have control over. And until we recognize that, we cannot solve the situation if we're going to go ahead and blame Haiti for the, 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 the situation caused by the imperialist powers. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jemima. Um, for holding for holding our our guests accountable to themselves and for bringing the reflection that 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 is needed right in the space as well. Um, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there are other questions. Would you be willing to, for Jemima? Would you be willing to share? Um, information around um, anti-imperial media in Nicaragua. I think it's checking the BAP site. I think there's a lot of information already out there. And, you know, I think part of this work, which um, we also share at Afro Resistance a lot, is there's a lot of information out there. Um, I think it's part of, um, I think it's part of a culture that has been developed where people want like things to come into inboxes. But I think, you know, it's also like getting out there and, and doing a lot of like some research, right? Um, because there's a lot of information out there and Black Alliance for Peace has a website. So look it up, blackallianceforpeace.org. And Jamima just shared it, great. And there's a lot of information out there. Afroresistance.org um, also has a lot of information out there. So their social media also has a lot of information and videos. So please um, go ahead and, and look up those two sites. 
and Policite Emanuela, please share your website as well. And um, Haitian Bridge Alliance, please um, do so as well. And we'll put them on we'll put them on the on the side as well. All right. Um, what else? There were other comments. Um, if you have, you can also raise your hand if you have another question. Um, the recording for this session will be available on our FaceTime, our FaceTime, on our Facebook page. Um, we're not sure what happened with Zoom today. Zoom sometimes does not want to cooperate. Technology, we did not invent it. We do not control it. So sometimes it's not our friend. It just happens like that. We can usually transmit it easily over Facebook or over YouTube. Today, it said it's not going to happen. And we just go with it. Um, and now something is happening with my audio. Um, if you have any other questions, please go ahead and raise your hand. Um, and we have um, we have a we another great resource for Haitians in need of mental for Haitians in Haiti needing mental health support. It's a free call. 2919 um, and it's a it's for that comes from from Martine as well. Um, Martine, do you want to speak a little bit about that? I think uh, mental health, uh, meeting your mental health needs is uh, pretty taboo in our culture, but it is coming around more and people are more talking about it. Um, there's more outreach also for children. Um, in that aspect. And now they have a free um, hotline. If you have any mental health needs or needed to speak to somebody, they have a therapist available um, seven days a week. Unfortunately, it's not 24 seven. I think it's weekdays, it's eight to eight to eight and weekends like eight to 12 or something. It's coming, but it's not there yet, but it is a good resource and a good service. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I know also that some of the challenges right now that the midwives are facing in Haiti is, um, is an overwhelm, right? Um, I know that the organization, Martine, um, you all are needing, are in need right now of, of, of data, access to data for, for midwives, right? So they are, there is a, partnership that we are working working on right now between Afro Resistance and the organization um, where we are trying to raise funds. So part of the funds fundraise, part of the funds that we are fundraising during this call will go directly to your organization so the midwives can have access to funds for data for their cell phones so they can further service birthing people in Haiti. So, and this is one of the calls for action that you can take right now. There will be a link that will be placed on the, on the chat for you to donate. It's just really important for, for us to um, continue donating um, to Afro Resistance and to other organizations, but in this case, to Afro Resistance, since we're hosting this call. Um, because these calls, as you see, we open the space for language justice, right? Um, Jamima mentioned that we have four, four languages that we're working on, English, Spanish, um, Creole, and Portuguese, right? And many times, you know, somebody, you know, within four minutes, somebody was already asking for interpretation. So people are getting used to our calls being multilingual. Multi, multilingual. Um, but what, it, what has that done? It has, it has brought together people, African descendants from the region that before couldn't communicate. And we're really proud of that work. But that work costs, right? So before, right, when we would host in English or organizations that host in English, it doesn't cost anything. But for us, our calls sometimes cost up to $420, $530 if we go over two, three minutes, because we want to make sure that interpreters are properly 
remunerated. Our interpreters are not volunteers. We do not take this lightly. Without them, these calls would not be possible, period. The information that you get would not be possible. Yes, sometimes we have technical difficulties. Sometimes we can't hear each other properly. Our, the interpreters that service these calls are not, are not sitting down um, in our, like we're not sitting down in air condition. They're sitting in throughout the region. So it means, you know, that we are also, um, opening up spaces for interpreters throughout the region to participate in our calls. So that's just one, one form that Afro-resistance is changing the game for Black interpreters, for Black women interpreters that wouldn't have access right, to these spaces. We know interpretation is dominated by non-Black people. We know this. I know this, right? Um, so we urge you to please donate. Part of the donations today, as we said, will be going to the Foundation for Advancement of Haitian Midwives um, um, in Haiti directly to Haitian midwives. And it'll be going for them to get data um, credits on their cell phones so that they can continue to service Haitian um, birthing people and families. I am a person that has, actually several women at Afro Resistance have used uh, midwives to bring their children to light. Um, I'm one of them, my two children were, I use midwives um, and I come from a lineage of women that have used midwives. So please um, consider donating. Um, so that's, that's our, that's my pitch for today. Um, if you have any other questions, please make sure to put them, put them on the chat. I do have a question specifically around, um, you know, I have, it's not a closing question, it's a, clo it's a question around the, I, I always wanna know, what can we do? Because I do not like thinking in an abstract, right? Um, I don't know, like thinking in an abstract. And a lot of people, um, especially when they're doing public policy and policy planning, right? They go into a space of, well, governments can't take this on just like that. I use a human rights analysis, right? I use a human rights analysis around, well, labor moves, right? Um, labor um, moves and exploitation happens, et cetera. You know, I understand all these issues. And then people go into the economic realities that different states, right? Not in the United States, but country states, right? Have and the, responsi the fiscal responsibilities that they have to have towards their people. How do, how, how do we see this, like, how do, what is the, what is the, what lens do we use to really have a gender analysis to the economic plight to this? Like, how do we organize, like, what is the social justice lens and the economic lens that we can use to really have impact as we organize around this issue? And I'm not sure if I'm if I'm clear because sometimes I get like, yes, I'm demanding human rights. I, I get it. I'm demanding human rights, um, humane treatment, like all these things are are all things that I believe in. Right? How do the economic the economic piece understanding that these understanding that they the economics exist, especially especially in the United States. The economics exist for everybody to thrive. Capitalism also exists. The one percent also exists, and poverty is real. I understand all these things. How are we going to 
how are we going to leverage these things, right? From a, from like, what, how do we see this? How do we see this moving and progressing, right? What is like, what do we need to do? Outside, you know, and we're organizing. And, and I'm asking because we have an economist here, right? And I'm not an economist. Um. Um, um, I kind of lost you in the middle of. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so if you just. Oh, is your microphone? Yes, I know. Yeah, there, the, my microphone. There's a, there the the economic. You know, I'm always fascinated with the economy, right? I'm not an economist, yeah. right? So when economists sit me down and they're explaining to me how the economic how the economy works, right? And I'm a human rights advocate, right? So what is the what is the gender perspective? Like, how do you analyze this situation from an economic perspective? Like, how do you see this playing out from an economic perspective? Understanding that me and you are on the same side. There, there is that one way, there is one way to say to see it. And this is something I wanted to mention in my presentation, but I, I, I forgot. Is that there is like the, I know in French we say that it is the feminization of poverty. I don't know if it's in English to mm -hmm. say the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like more women are get, like women are poor than men in Haiti. There are more women in the situation of poverty. And this might also explain why traditionally you will probably have more men willing to risk their life on such journey but nowadays like so many women are, are, are doing the same like when i was younger i knew stories about like women who are waiting for their husband um who either took a boat or took a plane to the u.s but now women are taking the world and it's even riskier, but there are even more women doing it. It's because of like increasing responsibilities also that women have. We all know like in a country like Haiti where there is, there is a law actually for child support, but it's not effective. Like few women actually know that they have this right. That, that they can go to court. And when they go to court, we know impunity. They don't really care about women's rights and the right that they have to get support for like people who get who have a child with them. And you have like women fa facing like having increasing responsibility and the cost is getting higher with inflation and the exchange rate, which is really important in Haiti because we depend so much on importation from the US. And this is also one of the reasons why the US is the destination of choice. Mm -hmm. And because people know that the dollars is the strongest currency in the region. So this is, also, this is also why when they are choosing, they don't choose to stop in the transit country. They want to go all the way to the US, not only because they know that they have more guarantee in terms of, because they claim that they have like right to asylum. It's also because this is the country, the richest country in the region. And you have like all this link, like women, like poverty in Haiti, poverty affecting women more than men. And also because of the because there is less opportunities in general for women than men, even if we have the strong like some very very strong women, the mother Sarah. If I don't know if you are familiar with it, like women in Haiti always already creative and like entrepreneurs starting their business strong, resilient. Even if I don't want to to use this word, but still in formal sectors, you will find more men than than women and it, it makes sense that now you have all of them willing to risk it all for for a better life and taking this long and terrible journey and there is also one thing is that families are now willing to invest in women to live because they know like when you invest in a woman, you invest in the whole family, and they, they tend to send a lot back home. 
they they do believe this and they do not hesitate like in even in like when i consider people i know i know more and more women like whose families are supporting to to leave to go on this kind of journey and yeah i don't know if you have more questions maybe i could add more no that's that's good no i think i think that's good um especially when you when you really break down the feminization of, of poverty because what we're seeing now and I and I've written about the feminization of migration and um, it's actually linked to um, the when the, there is a structural adjustment of policies in, in the United States there we see a, a restructuring of who migrates by gender uh -huh. into the United States to then allocate um, for that restructuring of policies because we see domestic work shift um, based on income levels in the United States. Uh -huh. And also, um, um, excuse me, just one Go second. Ahead, There's also something really interesting about this when we consider the gender perspective. Before, I think until the, until 90, 50, well, late 50, women could not leave the country without an authorization for, uh, of their husband. Like, it, it's sad, but this is under the dictatorship that that, that that dictator's wife kind of worked so that women could leave the country without an authorization from their husband. And it is interesting to see how we move from women not being able to travel without an authorization from their husband to women taking the boat to flee the country, just like men and women take, uh, taking this long journey to Central America, to, to Texas, to Mexico, Tijuana. And it is interesting. And, and this is like why it's, it matters that we have this kind of conversation. Why, why what changes? And I think it, it's both because, okay, now, now women, we, we, we understand that we have like a lot of responsibilities and we can do we have a right to find better living just like the others and despite the risk. And it's interesting to question how we move from, from this to, to the situation now. Uh -huh. um, I, I would like to add, um, Emanuela, of course, always such an honor to be in your presence. Thank you. Um, the Thank fact you. that you know, yesterday when we went to Tijuana and we met with 28, 28 families and a lot of them were single women with children who left Haiti, made the journey, who went to Brazil, Chile, um, and then found it, you know, nearly impossible for them to stay there. And they made the journey to the United States. And as you mentioned, this is not a, a common, um, practice, right, for, for, for Haitian women and women in general to be able to migrate by themselves without a husband or without a partner, especially knowing that the danger that that, that entails and also the fact that we have had a lot of uh, reports of rape throughout the journey. Um, and I spoke to another young woman and she expressed all of those difficulties with us. And then I said, will you do it again? And she said, yes, because I'm the only hope my entire family has. And so when we see that uh, as Haitian women, we always say that uh, Haitian women are the backbone of the country. And now we see our women leaving in search of a better life because they cannot they cannot survive in the homeland. They cannot raise their children at home. And as a Haitian woman, it was very painful for me to, to, witness, to bear witness to those realities that I myself am thinking, you know, it could have been me, right? And the many women we saw under the bridge, and I was under the bridge with them, but on the other side, the only thing that separated us was a chicken wire, but I could see my faces through their face. I could see my face through their faces. And, and, and to, to be able to be in the presence was extremely painful. And also understanding how Black women, Haitian women have been forced 
to, to create an alternative life for themselves in order not only to be able to support their, their, their children, but be able to take care of their aging parents and other people within their community and their families as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Gerleen. Um, very, very extremely important. We have, we have one more. Oh, Gerleen, I hope you haven't left us. We have one more question. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And that is, what is the strategy to fight genderized poverty? And immediately, how do we create strategies to alleviate conditions of poverty for Haitian women? knowing that the exploitation of black women is intentional in order to support the capitalist system in Haiti and around the world. Well, I, I'd like to take a stab at that. I think, you know, we have to have multiple strategies. There's not one strategy. I think you know, I think about what happened after the earthquake. There are all the billions of dollars that were raised um, that was raised um, for, for Haiti and how that was taken up by the oligarchy and, and the elite and hardly any money given, you know, used for Haitian people. And so I think there has to be multiple levels of, of action, right? There has to be, you know, there has to be the group of people who are like fighting against these foreign NGOs who are going in there for their own you know, for their own um, for their own <laughs> satisfaction, I think we have to be a, a strategy against those of us who have U.S. citizenship to fight against the U.S. going in there and destabilizing Haiti. There has to be, you know, strategies on the ground to help, you know, figure out how to navigate all this foreign intervention. There has to be strategies to raise money and get groups of people together to uh, educate so that people know what's going on. So I think, you know, we all have a role to play. And I think the strategies have to be many and it can't not be just one strategy. And I think even this conversation is part of the strategy, right? You know, just figuring out what's going on so we know the different dimensions of the situation because we can't help if we don't know what the problem is, what the cause of the problem is and, you know, how things are developing. Um, I think I would like to add something. I think we need to listen more to, to, to the people who want to help. Like we want to help Haitian women, then listen to Haitian women. And as part of my work, I, I went to Hans, um, a region in Haiti, and then for some training for women who wanted to do politics. And one of them said something that, that was really interesting to me. She said that, okay, we've had enough of trainings. We, like all NGOs came here and trained us. We are not winning elections because we do not have money. And this is, was a perfect example. Like the problem, like they know what they want. They know why they are failing. Yet we keep giving them what we want, what we can realize in the amount of time we are willing to work in Haiti. And I think it's about time we listen. People from, hey, women from the South probably have different needs from the women in port au -Prince. And I think that the idea should be to listen to them. Of course, some people will say things that do not make sense or that are not like, that won't have an impact. We can still improve the ideas, but we need to start from there and like give them real resources. Enough with the qualms and like the micro projects and there is always some kind of pilot project where people working on those projects end up getting paid more than the amount of money that goes to the people. This needs to stop. And this goes with the people seeing exactly what they want, knowing exactly what amount of money is being spent on their name so that they can hold those people accountable too. Because at the end of the day, what happened is that everyone is investing in Haiti investing in the wrong projects, yet they are blaming the people, the Haitian people when they fail and this need to stop. And we need to start holding those people accountable. And yeah, there is a lot to say, like <laughs> Jemima said, but I think part of it is to start listening to the people and implement projects that the people want that have the potential to have an impact instead of those projects that are one size fit all that will please the donors 
and then have like smart objective measurable but won't do any impact in people's life uh -huh. i'd like to tag on what both of you said is so right on i feel like i almost don't have anything else to add yeah. to that. <laughs> but the the beauty is if you're really um community-based and community-led the ideal is for the them to go on with where if you're there you're not there or if you know life goes on they should be able to carry on and do what they do and i think that's the missing link because of the savior mentality of philanthropy of um going to help are you helping for yourself or like what is your real objectives i i understand introducing new concepts because what you don't know you don't know but if it's not workable or they don't see it as a value, it's not a value for their lives. And I think that's something that um, this uh, world grapples with because then what, we won't be needed? Like, why, where would you go? Like Haitian people need us to save them. So it's like, no, we don't. We, we can save ourselves. We need the backing up, the resources to help us stand on our two feet. And you know, I think that's the part that's always, always missing. I can briefly add as well, and we can use the um, the earthquake in 2010, and then you know the recent earthquake as an example of I'm going to come and bring you a cup of rice, and I'm going to throw a um, a bottle of water at you, and then I will leave, and I will pat myself in the back, and then um, and then. Um, organizations and countries will come in, they will father babies and they will not take care of them. And they will bring cholera, they will not take accountability for it. And then um, we will come back and we will have a, a group of people and we'll come back, we will come and we, we will adopt one or two kids um, while we are at it and then pat ourselves in the back without the leadership of the people we are called to serve. And what I say is building sustainability, understanding that earthquake will continue to happen. So when the US aids come after they do the rescue and uh, rapid response and they do do the rice distribution, then what happens when the next earthquake comes because we don't have the roads to sustain mobility we don't have the hospitals to care for the sick. We don't have the schools to educate our children with what it means to be part, to have the pride that is that is rooted in 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 uh, what we call Fatima da Pautenus. Um, and we continue to export, you know, uh, um, we continue to export great minds. We continue to export young men and mothers, and we continue to import uh, gangs and violence and all of those things that are, I will repeat, that are uh, a foreign to Haitian community. So the thing we are seeing in Haiti right now with kidnappings and gangs, these are foreign and they have been imported into the country. So while we look into how we move forward and we look into how we are going to provide aids, right? I think sustainability, how do we create housing, how can we create hospitals and schools and roads for people to be secure, to be safe in their own homes. So we are tired of receiving the hands out that continues to create a space for us to simply be dependent on that cup of rice and that bottle of water. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Gerline. I think you have actually um, brought it all together, right? I think you've actually brought it all together. I, I really want to thank each and every one of our panelists today. Um, there was something key that um, was said and challenged, and I really appreciate it because this concept of resilience that several several of you um, challenge, right? The resilience that is placed on, on the people of Haiti that has to be continued, um, you know, that Haitian people are resilient, right? The black people are resilient. It's like black people are human beings, Haitian people are human beings and people break, right? So I really wanna honor the humanity of, of 
of everybody here and the people of Haiti and Haitian women um, is something that's really important for, for myself and for everybody at Afro-Resistance and Afro-Resistance as an organization as well. Um, also, I also want to personally thank Martine, Emanuela, Jamima, and Gerline for making the time to and honoring that time for being here today. Um, time is precious and valuable, especially during these times, so we don't take that lightly here. Um, all our time is valuable, but when, you know, when you're of the community that you're leading and you're part of that community, it takes a special effort and energy. And each of the organizations that you're representing, you are part of that and you're doing the work. And that's something that, that we are so proud of, of, uh, of in Afro-resistance, where the people that are leading are part of as well which is not common and, and we pay the price, right? We pay the price of that. So thank you for, for that as well. Um, as we remind you as well, please follow each of the organizations. We shared all the, all the, all the links. Um, please do your research. Don't expect emails. Um, the information is out there. Just log on, do your readings um, and please donate. Part of the donations today will go directly to Haitian midwives in on the island for them to have access to data. And please sign up, right? We have regional black migration. We have a regional black migration working group that happens every, every month, the third Thursday of each month. Black Alliance for Peace has a Haitian working group that happens. I believe the second Thursday of each month, Jamima. The yes. second Thursday of each, the second Thursday of each month, we can include information on that um, in the Afro Resistance newsletter. But the information, I believe, is also on the Black Alliance for Peace um, website, um, and it's also a way if if you enjoyed Jamima today. Jamima, I think, facilitates those conversations, so you can also get involved. And check out the websites, right? So you can also get involved in what's happening, um, what Haitian Bridge Alliance, um, and with, with the different organizations that are here today. Thank you so very much.